All right, there we go. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for coming out tonight. I'm going to share my screen in a second here. So you have something to look at besides me. So close your eyes so you don't, so don't see anything um, right there. Now I've lost all of you. <laughs> I'm afraid to hit my escape button because then I'll, where did you, I know where you went. Hold on. There we go. There we go. So, um, oh, um, I'm not yeah. seeing, are you yeah, not seeing I'm... the shared screen? Yeah. You know why? Cause I forgot. That's why. Cause I forgot to hit, we practiced this all before <laughs> you guys got here and, uh, it was perfect. And I was like, oh, I do this a million times. Here you go. Thank you, Liz. For there we go. It wouldn't be a gonna... library program if we didn't have some kind of a technical <laughs> difficulty. I was like, why don't I see your faces? Cause normally I see your pictures and that was why. Um, so um, many of you I know have done uh, these talks before so but you can move that box with the pictures um, and you have some options there so you can minimize it completely that's the little dash right above the pictures, you can just show the active speaker you can show a couple or you can do a grid so it also can get moved around your screen so feel free to um, move it out of the way so whatever works for you so you can see what you need to see on the screen. So I think many of of you may have come here because you may be fans of uh, Masterpiece Theater's Downton Abbey TV show. Um, and many of you just from kind of curiosity and interest in history and media culture and media history. But I start off with this picture of Downton Abbey or the real High Clare Castle um, to talk about the popularity of British servant stories, particularly for American media. When Downton Abbey came out, it is the most nominated non-US television show in Emmy history. It was nominated for 69 Emmys and it won 12 over its six years while it was on television. They estimate that more than 120 million people worldwide watched the show while it was being aired and it was broadcast in more than 250 countries and territories. So of course, yes, United States and Great Britain, but also in the Middle East, in Korea and in Russia. When Julian Fellows, the creator of Downton Abbey, was asked whether he possibly could have predicted the popularity and global phenomenon that Downton Abbey became. He said there was no way anyone could ever have predicted how the show was going to go viral with audiences worldwide. But I would actually argue with Julian Fellows a little bit, because when you start looking at the history of media, particularly in the United States, what you find is actually a long tradition, at least 50 years of books television and films that focus on servant stories. So what we're going to talk about tonight is what maybe our fascination with these stories tell us about our own identities, about national identity, um, class identity, gender identity, and maybe even racial identity in the United States today. I'm pausing just for a second because someone just pulled up in my driveway, but we're going to ignore that. <laughs> so, um, so let's start off with a little bit of history. So um, how many people worked in service, you know, over the last 100, 150 years? So in about 1861, and we're going to start talking about um, British cultural history here, because what you find over and over again in a lot of these traditions is kind of British stories with British characters. So in 1861, you've got the census reported that you had about 62,000 men working as indoor servants and almost a million women working as indoor servants as well. Now, this doesn't take into account anybody who's working as a gardener or a coachman or who may be working in agriculture on a particular estate. When you get to 1901, we really kind of get the peak of British servants according to the British census. You have a little bit of decline with the men, 47,000 men, and just under one and a half million women working as servants at this time period. When you get to the 20th century, you start to see um, a big decline, right? 1950s, we only have 250,000 people working nationwide employed as domestics at all. And by 1961, you have another huge drop. We're down to about 100,000 people working as domestic servants in Britain. And I'm sure many of you can already hypothesize some reasons why we might have had some decline in the 1950s and 60s. And we'll talk about some of those significant events a little bit later on. <clears throat> so one of the big questions also is who had servants and how many did they have? I think one of our assumptions is that 
Households or castles or mansions like Welbeck Abbey pictured here were the only estates that were able to afford to have servants. But the reality is a lot more people across the class spectrum in the UK was able to afford to have some kind of help. So according to the census in about 1911, more than 800,000 families in Britain employed some kind of servant, um, but only about 20% had more than three. So that actually means that working in lower class um, families were actually able and often did hire at least one servant, a domestic servant, often a girl in her early teens who may come in to do day work, to help with cleaning, to help with cooking, to help with laundry and different kinds of work there. The middle classes, of course, were much more set up. They may have up to five or seven servants, including a butler, a couple of maids, of course, to help keep the household, a professional cook, and then someone, a governess or a nanny to help take care of their children. But of course, you know, the upper classes and the aristocracy really did have the lion's share of servants. Many of them had as many as 60 to 90 indoor servants alone just to maintain their household. And some of those servants in the largest household had servants of their own to take care of their clothing and their apartments within the estate. So quite a few. And again, we're talking indoor servants here specifically. Now, once um, the, the average age for a person to go into domestic service is about 14 years old. So pretty young, you know, early teens there. And when they went into a household, they found a very hierarchical organization, as you can see from this picture. The butler and the housekeeper, of course, were the um, top servants in charge of the household. Even though this picture shows them kind of on equal basis, the butler was definitely the head of the household and would make about at least 20 pounds more a year than the housekeeper would. They each had kind of different areas of control underneath them. And you can see other areas as well. The cook was in charge of the kitchen maids and that realm. <clears throat> the housekeeper, of course, was in charge of kind of cleaning the household as well as any kind of laundry stuff. Um, the butler was in charge really of the front of house. His specific job was to make sure that the front of the household and the main living areas were working kind of an optimum um, ability it in optimum ways. The first footman, for example, which you can see there on the screen on the right, really was the face of the household. Um, and first footman could be paid significant amounts of money um, to be the people who greeted guests coming in or who would open the front door. There were pretty strict requirements to make it to be promoted to a first footman. Um, in particular, you had to be pretty tall. So if you were over six feet tall, you could make more money than you could for footmen who were less than six feet tall. You had to be very good looking and you actually had to be kind of a a, a strong physical specimen. One of my kind of best um, finds in research was I thought was fascinating was um, 19th century magazines in the back they would have all these advertisements like magazines do today especially ones that were um, geared toward domestic servants there were these ads for um, pads that footmen would put in the back of their stockings to make their calves look more muscular so they would be a better kind of masculine specimen in the front of the house. Over on the left hand side, you can see the valet, um, or as the Brits would like to say, valet and the lady's maid, as well as the governess. These are kind of separated off because they often had a higher social class actually in the domestic service world than the other servants in the house. They may actually be um, daughters or sons from middle class um, or, or kind of upper middle class families who had good education, but may not have had um, enough financial resources to either for a woman to marry her off to provide her with a dowry or for a gentleman to be able to set him up in a different business. So oftentimes they would go into domestic service. Um, they had kind of the class distinctions, the right accents and the right education to be able to integrate in with the, um, with the family in the household themselves. So I mentioned um, one of the servants that you don't see on this um, hierarchical chart, of course, are the chauffeurs. You know, um, many households estimated they had about equal number around 1910, equal number of chauffeurs and coachmen. Um, by 1921, though, um, most households reported having more chauffeurs as the automobile came along. Now, being a chauffeur in 1900 or 1910, for example, was a highly specialized position. It would require the person to be 
almost as much a mechanic as it would be to be an engineer. So they had very specialized knowledge. They may have kind of grown up or been educated um, and trained in different kinds of environments. And so there are lots of kind of biographies and stories about chauffeurs not fitting in well with the very hierarchical rule bound um, sphere of the domestic servants in the domestic halls. So uh, that's one of my favorite um, quotes about the servants themselves too. They said they came into these households with all the impudence and glamour and without any servility at all. So they didn't respect the rules. They didn't respect the hierarchy, hierarchies within the domestic um, kitchen in the household or, the, or respect those um, people who were kind of higher ranking within the household themselves. They were also seen as a kind of a particular threat to the family of the household as well because of their proximity and the intimacy that they were granted to the family. For a lot of the other servants, there was a real divide between the upstairs and the downstairs. You know, oftentimes, even though we like to see television shows, so real intimate relationships where servants are sharing, you know, their hopes or dreams and their heartaches with the domestic, with the uh, masters and mistresses of the house. The reality was that that usually did not happen at all, and there were much stronger class distinctions between the two. But with the chauffeurs, I mean, you have to think about the difference between a coachman and a chauffeur, chauffeur just within the um, vehicles themselves. So with a coachman, you have the children or the members of the family who are enclosed inside the coach itself, and the coachman was outside of the coach. So there was a deliberate and kind of um, very structural separation between the classes there. But once you got to the automobile, the chauffeur now is seated inside the vehicle with the family, sometimes with a glass barrier in between, sometimes not, sometimes in an open air like a convertible. And what this allowed for was um, more kind of intimacies and, and conversation and sharing between the servant, the chauffeur, and the domestic um, household. This was particularly a concern for those families that had um young ladies and if you watch Downton Abbey you'd know um if you had a young daughter that to be worried about these sexy chauffeurs um themselves so Lady Sybil of course was the youngest daughter um in the Grantham family she's a rebel she's a suffragette um she kind of disagrees and argues with her parents all the time well she ends up of course falling in love with and even marrying their chauffeur Tom Branson who not only of course is a servant and of the lower classes, working classes, for example, but of course he's also an Irish nationalist. So this causes tons of scandal and controversy with her family, um, which lead to, you know, kind of more and more um, heartache as the TV show goes through the years. What we see even after Lady, si Lady Sybil dies in childbirth is that Tom Branson, even though he's the father of their child who is going to be part of the and potentially inheriting, you know, money from the Grantham estate, um, he never is integrated fully into that household. He always remains a servant or employee of the Grantham family, and those class divides are never kind of broken officially all the way through. So probably a lot of the jobs I've already talked about were ones that were familiar to you, but in the larger estates, you really start to find some unique positions on their rosters. So a couple of examples, you know, so you could have a useful maid who literally was a young maid who was supposed to make herself useful. She may be a chaperone, for example, for the young ladies of the house to go to the neighbors. Um, there was an odd man like you might have today, you know, usually he was an indoor servant who wasn't good looking enough to be a footman um, and be in the front of house. And so he was doing odd jobs um, inside and around the house itself. One of my favorites that I found um, on a, a Scottish um, employment roster was an, kind of an older um, pensioner um, who was listed on their em employment list as the letter Betty. And so all she did for her job was open letters. And I think of like, if I had to go back 100 years and be a domestic servant, I think I would like that job myself. Some other really interesting ones, there's a steel boy and he worked in the stables and his job was to polish all of the brass or silver tack that they had there to make sure it was shiny and gleaming. 
And one of my other favorites was um, what they called a tiger. And so again, this kind of goes with the coachman and with the coach. They would take a young boy either from the household or from one, one of the neighboring tenant farms, and they would dress him up in the household's uniform, their livery, and they would sit him on top of the coach. And then when it would drive around town or we go on for a longer trip to visit, people would be able to see the uniform that he was wearing and they would know what household that the coach um, and the occupants belong to. So I love to think of the, the tiger as kind of a, 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 a historic kind of actually living hood ornament, right? <laughs> that they would have with this little boy um, on their um, coaches. There's lots of different kinds of outdoor um, domestic servants as well. There are people whose full-time job was to take care of fences and hedges. Um, you had young boys who would sleep with the livestock, with the pigs and the cows. Slaters, their full-time job was just replacing and repairing the slate roofs and many of these really large estates. In a special I saw a couple of years ago on PBS called something like Lost Mansions of the Dukes or something like that, there was this woman who was um, getting estimates on how much it was going to cost to fix her roof. And the mansion, the estate house that she had was so big that her roof was literally acres, acres in size, and it was going to be over a million pounds um, just to give, get a new roof on that. And then they also had spider brushers. These really are people who would go around with brushes and brush away spider webs from windows and, and doorways so that you wouldn't get caught in your face. But one of my favorites that I found in a couple of different places um, were ladies maids whose job at the end of the day was to wash the loose change of their mistresses. So now you have to imagine, so if you're a young lady or a woman of a household, you may have a purse or a reticule of your own and some money so that you could go into the village and you may go to a tea shop or maybe you go to a millinery shop and buy ribbons to you know put on your bonnet or um, dressmaker shops and things like that. Well, when you got home at the end of the day, you know, you had this money, you know, you'd engaged in commerce, you know, gasp, and you didn't know who had touched that money and you wouldn't want it to tarnish your beautiful gloves. And so the ladies maids would have to empty out the ladies purses at the end of the day and they would literally wash with soap and water all of the money that was in their purses and then they would have it ready and fresh and clean to go the next day. So I just love to think of this as maybe the, the first literal example also of money laundering, which we would find in the 19th century as well. Now, we've already talked a little bit about how men were kind of the pretty faces of these uh, mansions, um, but women were the real grafters and had to do a lot of the hard work. You know, service was significantly um, difficult with a lot of physical labor involved. Um, historians estimate that a single maid or serving girl in a d small domestic house could be estimated to carry up to three tons of water in a single week in order to pull baths or to wash floors or to do laundry. Laundry was a significant labor. It could take an average working class woman two full days to do the laundry of her household um, manually. So if you think about how laborious that is, you know, it's shocking when you hear of an aristocrat like Lady Astor who would change her clothes five times a day according to the occasion. So she would wear a morning dress, you know, for breakfast. And if she had to go make calls out with other people, she would have a dress to go out, dresses for tea, um, if they were going out to a ball, um, different kinds of evening gowns and things like that. Every time Lady Astor changed her clothes, her gloves, her cuffs or her collars had to be laundered and ironed. So it was a significant amount of work um, and made for really long days, particularly for women servants. So this is actually from a, um, an autobiography of a woman who ran a larger um, household um, all the way up to the 1950s. And she kind of talks about what a normal morning might look like for a domestic servant. So she says, as the duties of a general servant are many and varied, she's usually expected to be up at 6 a.m. in the summer and 6.30 in the winter. She opens the windows and airs the rooms, cleans the kitchen range, lights the fire, tidies the dining room grate and lights the fire there, 
after which she'll take hot water to the bedrooms, brush the boots, and fill the coal scuttles. It will then be time to cook and serve the breakfast, after which she will clean the front step unless it's possible to do this before preparing the first meal of the day. So this was all before breakfast time and how much labor she had to do. Um, and oftentimes they had to stay up until the household went to bed. And if they went out to a ball um, or to an evening entertainment, that could be the, really the wee hours of the morning. So the days were long. They got very few days off, um, if any. Sometimes it may have been a half a day a month. Sometimes it may have been a half day on Sundays. So significant amount of work, particularly for women um, specifically. So when you think about, you know, how much labor is involved um, and how many servants some of these households um, had, we start to kind of wonder, um, how much would it take? How much money would it actually take to run a large manor house like you see in Downton Abbey? Well, a couple of economists a couple of years ago decided to estimate in modern day money, this is going to be in British pounds, so I'll do some conversions for us too. How much would it take the Crawley family, right, to um, be able to run a household like Downton Abbey today? So they looked at everything from utilities like gas and electric and oil, security, how much money you'd have to maintain the grounds. Now this is all in British pounds, so we can estimate multiply all these amounts by maybe one and a half to get American dollars. So this is an annual bill, right? So your gas and electric bill would be about half a million dollars a year in American dollars. Maintaining the grounds, you know, groundskeeping could be upwards of 400,000 American dollars. Your oil bill, remember this is before inflation, right? Your oil bill could be anywhere from about 900,000 American dollars a year. And they kept looking like, well, how much would it cost to maintain it per year? How much would it be in gardening? Cleaning alone, right, would be about one and a half million dollars. And they added all these different elements up and they estimated that it would cost about, let's say seven and a half to eight million American dollars a year just to run Downton Abbey in contemporary money. And again, this is before inflation, right? So I think it makes me think like how much money would you have to have in order to spend $8 million a year just to run your house, right? Just as your normal kind of annual expenses for that. And I think it's really hard for a lot of us in America, maybe people worldwide, to try to understand that kind of wealth um, that you see in many of these households. Now, we talked about some of the statistics and we said, oh, wow, we hit like 1950, 1960, and we saw this huge drop in domestic service. Well, what happens? Well, of course, the first thing you probably all thought of um, is, you know, the impact of World War One and World War II. There were significant economic um, as well as population impacts for Great Britain um, due to those wars. Um, the First World War and definitely the second essentially bankrupted um, the United Kingdom and caused significant hardships. And there are estimates that more than 25% of men under the age of 48 died in one of those two wars. So there's a huge decline in the male population, for example, for people to work in domestic service. Um, but there's also um, other factors that made women less inclined to join as well. Now, I talked about um, the wars kind of bankrupting the nation. To compound that, there was a post-war agricultural depression after both world wars. And so many of these estates made their money on farming. You see this in watching Downton Abbey. Um, they're trying to kind of um, modernize their farming um, so that they can be more efficient and make more money. Well, after the wars, there was a, a significant agricultural depression that corn, wheat, um, livestock, you know, there was a huge fall in those markets. So that meant that a lot of these major estates that took most of their income from tenant farming didn't have the money anymore to be able to maintain the household at the level that it had. And so you see families begin to sell off parcels and acres of land. You see this in Downton Abbey, it happens a couple of different times. And you see many households who aren't able to um, keep the estate or keep the house. The background picture here is actually um, of one of these manor houses, Beau Dessert House, where the family decided actually to dynamite um, the manor house because 
then they could sell off the land and parcel it and make more money back. One thing we don't talk about really or see in the television and film versions either is that many of these domestic servants actually lived and worked in very poor conditions. Again, we like to, to see the kind of familiar um, familial environments in shows like Downton Abbey or in different kinds of movies. But for many of these domestic servants, you went into these houses and, and pretty much no one saw you again other than the, the other servants in the household for the rest of your life. And if you imagine you're a tenant farmer on this estate and you have your 14 year old daughter, maybe she's your 14th kid and you don't know how you're going to provide for her. And there's an opportunity for her to go to work in the big house. And it's kind of a relief for you as a parent because, you know, you know that she'll have housing provided for her and food provided for her for the rest of her life until you know she becomes um, um, needs to retire or is pensioned off. But what we don't know is the types of things that happened in there. So there's lots and lots of stories where um, people um, went into domestic service and were really worked to the bone. There were no regulations or laws about fair working conditions or hours. Um, many of them didn't have adequate heat, um, so they may be living in um, rooms that de didn't have any heat sources at all. Some of them were being starved, were not provided enough food. Many were expected to pay for their own uniforms and shoes out of their annual salaries, and a good pair of boots could take over 50% of the money that you'd earn for a year. Um, this kind of came more and more to the public's attention at the end of the 19th century, and there started to be new regulations about um, hours and working conditions for domestic servants. Um, so there were a lot of anonymous um, letters sent into newspapers and magazines. Um, we mentioned already that they did not get hardly any time off and their, their hours were really kind of controlled by the family there. Um, but one other thing they were not allowed to do is they were not allowed to get married or to date anyone, which totally goes against what Downton Abbey always shows you, right? Because everybody couples up in Downton Abbey, um, particularly for women. You know, if you got a domestic servant and you got married, you know, you were expected to quit your position um, because your husband was going to provide for you. And if either one of you, male or um, female servant, was found to kind of be dating or fooling around, you could get fired. Um, and not get what they call the character and you wouldn't be able to get another job because you'd have no recommendation for you. Lastly, one of the other big factors um, that impacted the decline and fall um, was really opportunities for other kinds of work. So the rise of factories um, and industrialization provided more opportunities for young people, particularly uneducated people, um, to work and support themselves that did not have to be in domestic service. Now, as a comparison, like around 1900, 1901, domestic service was the largest occupation for working class people, particularly for women. Around that time period, more than 25% of working class women were working in domestic service in some capacity. When we get to the teens um, and then up to the 40s, particularly with the influence of the war and industrialized kind of urban centers have factories and huge needs for factory workers with the rise of industrialization. And so young people can go and move to the city um, you, where you can work. You get Sundays off every single week. Um, you have limited hours because, of course, there are um, legislation for um, how many hours a normal work day can be with the rise of unionization in the 19th century. Um, and then you can also like rent a room in a, in a boarding house and live with other young people. You can date, you can get married. There's a lot more freedoms working in factories than there were in domestic service. And so there's just more opportunities for people, working class people to do other things than work in service. And that had a huge impact as well in the half of the 20th century. Now, one last kind of impact for the decline of um, domestic service, especially on the upper classes, was the role that kind of post-war taxation and inheritance taxes had on the wealthiest people. So I mentioned, you know, the country went into an economic bankruptcy after World War I. Economists estimate Britain didn't get out of really that bankruptcy and recover until about the 1980s. Um, and so, you know, like any country, the government had to figure out a way how they were going to get money, you know, in order to be able to run the country. And so um, they decided 
I was muted. Sorry. So did we all lose internet there? Anybody want to nod at me? All right. I'm going to share my screen again and get you back on. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Here we go. So I'm going to, I'm going to abbreviate this because I don't know where I lost you. So we were talking about um, inheritance taxes and post-war taxation after World War I and World War II and how England was going to make their money back. Um, Chatsworth House, the Duke of Devonshire, his father died. He inherited this big mansion. The house and the estate had been in his family for over 500 years. And in 1950, he was hit with an 80% tax on that estate, which is the equivalent today of about $60 million. So he had to come up with $60 million in order to be able to hold this estate in his family that had been in there for centuries. And one of the most amazing stories about this is that he actually was able to do it. Um, it's yeah. phenomenal to me that the Duke of Devonshire was able to pay off. Uh, Anne, I have a quick question. Um, I saw, I unfortunately had to deal with something outside for a bit. Sure. Someone said that there is no sound. Um, can everyone say a, um, a raise your hand if you can hear Anne? When I, we came back on Zoom, um, oh, okay. I was muted. So I was checking to see if they could hear me. And I think okay. I figured that out. I joked. I'm like, I'm like, oh, I hope this like stays okay for like the three minutes. And, <laughs> and already, I'm sorry. The internet. that's right. All right. I'm sorry about that. Carry on, everybody. <laughs> no, that's all right. Um, yeah. So the Duke of Devonshire was able to pay it off. Now, remember, we've already looked at like how much would it cost to run one of these places per year? And we think it's like eight million American dollars. Not only did he pay that $8 million to run it every year, he and his taxes, don't forget he had to pay his regular annual taxes, he still came up with $60 million. It took him 30 years to pay it off, but he was able to do that. A lot of families couldn't, and you saw between 1920 and about 1962, 25 to 45% of these big, huge estates um, were sold or torn down because people could just could not afford to pay the taxes um, or to be able to maintain them anymore or find people even to work in them. So many of them were sold to um, hotel chains. So many of you may have traveled to Europe or had a friend who's like, oh my gosh, we stayed in my hotel and it was a castle or it was in a mansion. This is why they couldn't pay their taxes, right? And so they had to sell it off. Um, so by the time we get to the middle of the century, right, when we had that huge kind of drop off in servants, we started the century with almost a million families, almost everybody be able to afford to have some kind of domestic servants. By not, about the 1950s, only 6% of families are able to have any kind of domestic help at all. And those really are going to be the royalty, right, the, the royal family, as well as the wealthiest aristocrats in the country. For the average kind of British person, this becomes quite out of reach. Now, it's fascinating that exactly at the time where it seems kind of like this way of life is completely disappearing off of um, the face of history, it's exactly the same time that it becomes such a phenomenon. This kind of story and these kind of characters become phenomena um, in Britain and in the United States. Before we kind of get into our contemporary kinds of media like film and television, though, when you actually start looking back in literary history, you realize that there's actually been servants as characters in a lot of the most famous fiction um, and, and plays and even comics going back hundreds of years. So for example, if we go back to Don Quixote, which is arguably the first novel ever written, published in 1615, Sancho Panza is Don Quixote's servant. He goes with him to protect him um, as he's going out and kind of, kind of tilt at windmills, right? Some other kind of famous stories that you may have heard of, like Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. The person who is our narrator for that entire novel is Nellie Dean, who is a housekeeper um, for the Grange. Um, Robert Louis Stevenson's um, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which is a, a, an odd book if you've ever read it. The last chapter is all from um, Dr. Jekyll's butler's perspective. J.M. Barry, who wrote Peter Pan, wrote a really successful play in the early 1900s about a butler. Um, they show up in mysteries um, like Dorothy Sayers and in comic books like Batman, right? Um, as well as the adventures in the 
40s, 50s, and 60s as well. So they pepper kind of a lot of these very famous stories, but we just either haven't seen them or we haven't talked about them very much. But it's really when you start looking at film and then later television, we start to see how pervasive these kinds of characters and stories are. So I'm going to start with, you know, I call the queen mother, right, of the servant narrative, Julie Andrews. <laughs> um, Julie Andrews kind of, you know, right, comes onto the movie scene um, in the 1960s, 1964, as Mary Poppins, of course. Um, and then, of course, in The Sound of Music in 1965. These are two hugely successful films. They're still played on television, right, every single year now. At both of them, Julie Andrews is playing a servant, right? Mary Poppins, she comes in as a housekeeper. And then Maria, of course, in The Sound of Music comes in as a governess to the um, Baron von Tropp's children. These are hugely successful films. Um, one estimate I saw that said that Mary Poppins is still one of the top 20 highest grossing films that Disney Studios has ever made. The Sound of Music was the highest grossing box office film from 1965 until 1970 for five years running straight. So they're hugely successful. And at both of them, we have this character who works as some kind of domestic servant, um, whether it's in England or it's in Austria. There's other kind of literary films like um, The Remains of the Day, um, where you have Anthony Hopkins playing this butler named Mr. Stevens and a, a beautiful young Emma Thompson here who plays the housekeeper, Miss Kensington. This was actually based on a 1989 novel by Kazuo Ishiguro, which won the Booker Prize. It's a really beautiful book. Um, and it kind of follows um, Stevens's reflections on his life and the contributions that he has or has not made um, to history and the significance of his work as a butler serving in major households. Um, the book is, I mean, the movie's wonderful and just absolutely beautiful, but the book itself is, is really well, well, well done. Um, there's fun comedies, if you remember, like Arthur, you know, we have the wonderful um, drunken orphan Dudley Moore, um, who is taken care of by his butler Hobson, played by the wonderful Sir John Gildgood. There were at least two or three different Arthur films where we start to see kind of this figure of the butler as a father figure, particularly for um, wealthy young men who may be lost, um, don't have parents to give them directions and servants kind of step in to go ahead and do that. One of the funny scenes actually in the remains of the day is that that head of the household lord Darlington asks Mr. Stevens to tell his give his nephew with a lecture about the birds and the bees. His next was played by Hugh Hugh Grant. So this man's like 25 years old and it's incredibly awkward. So one of those kind of, I think, um, nice little parodies of um, the father, the butler as father figure. We talked already that, you know, they show up, butlers and servants show up in comic books, and of course that comes incredibly popular in the film versions of those comic books as well. And this, of course, is Michael Caine, who played um, Alfred Pennyworth in the Dark Knight Rises trilogy, which came out. These are the Christopher Nolan Batman films. Um, one fun thing, you know, you, you always want to ask yourself, or at least I do, like, what in the world is this British butler doing taking care of this American, you know, wealthy mogul? Like, like how did he get this guy to kind of come into his family? And um, in the last couple of years, um, the Epic's kind of cable network show tried to imagine like what is Alfred's backstory that would make him, you know, be a good butler and partner for the Cape Crusader. And as you can see, kind of just looking at the the trailer poster, you know, we're imagining he has some kind of spy or military background that would make him a good partner um, for Bruce Wayne in the United States. Um, one of the others that was really popular film in 2002 is Gosford Park, Robert Altman's film. Um, Altman did a ton of research in order to make this movie. He actually himself called the movie a training film for domestic service. They had learned so much. It has a huge cast. I mean, you can kind of, I always joke that this is the hardest slide I have to do because I kid, could not fit everything and every one onto one computer screen. You've got everything from Eileen Atkins and Helen Mirren, Clive Owen, and Kristen Scott Tom and Maggie Smith again, you know, and it really is kind of this mystery um, of an upstairs uh, weekend party 
and things that are happening downstairs with the servants and old histories and there's kind of a murder mystery involved in there. It did win the Academy Award in 2002 for best screenplay. And if we were together, you know, and could be a little more interactive, I would ask you, do you know who wrote the screenplay for Gosford Park when it won the Academy Award? I see no. Julian Fellows, the creator of Downton Abbey, <laughs> won an Oscar for writing the screenplay for Gosford Park. So when he said in 2013, I couldn't have possibly imagined that Downton Abbey would have been so successful. And I thought, really? You're, you've won an Oscar for the exact same story, right? You know, 10 years ago. So he's he definitely, you know, kind of has his uh, formula down. I'm not saying, I'm not critiquing that at all because I love it just as much as you do, right? My favorite, though, film, I think, which is just really interesting, which kind of taps into our fascination maybe with um, Britishness, is Mrs. Doubtfire. We don't think of this as a typical servant film, um, but just for a little kind of summary. So it came out in 1993, starred Robin Williams and Sally Field as an unhappily married couple. They had three children. Sally Field's a really successful, powerful business owner. And Robin Williams is in does voices and impersonations and things like that. And he's kind of a very playful childlike dad. And so he has more fun being a kid with his kids than he does being a dad with his kids. And Sally Field basically kind of finally loses um, her patience and decides they need to get a divorce. Um, things happen and, and Robin Williams isn't even allowed to have kind of custody of his children or just be with them unsupervised. So Sally Field decides she needs to hire a housekeeper to help her maintain the household. So Robin Williams comes up with this great idea that he's going to go in disguise and he's going to apply for the job to be the housekeeper for his own children. And so he gets this great scene in the movie um, where he goes through all of these different kind of characters and impersonations and prosthetics and costumes and things like that before he settles on um, this wonderful soft-spoken Scottish woman, Iphigenia Doubtfire, who becomes this kind of impersonation of perfect kind of home, you know, um, the perfect home. So Mrs. Doubtfire comes in and makes everyone's life better almost instantly. She learns how to be a gourmet cook. She cleans the house, as you can see here. She tutors the children. She gives them life advice. Um, she amazingly, as you know, as soon as she adopts this Scottish accent, seems to be the perfectly capable housekeeper and parent that American Robin Williams could never be. So it's this great kind of assumption there of authority, especially with parenting and housekeeping, that somehow, you know, Mrs. Doubtfire's Britishness brings to her character in a way that Robin Williams as this American dad never could. We're going to see that kind of theme come up more and more when we start looking at television. Now, you know, I've kind of given a smattering of some TV of t film versions. TV, you know, TV servants go back almost as far as television. And I don't even have Leave it to Beaver on here or um, some of the older TV shows that we have as well. But Family Affair in the 1960s and 70s is kind of a really interesting example of the rise of television culture and the rise of kind of the upper classes in the United States. So you have Brian Keith, who's the successful architect bachelor living in New York City, and he ends up having to take in his, um, I think it's his brother's three children. So they've been orphaned from a car accident and they have to come and live with him and his manservant, Mr. French. And it's this great kind of early um, 60s um, visualization of what does class and success look like for kind of um, the successful American man. He's got this amazing penthouse in Manhattan. Um, he ha is very um, erudite and um, sophisticated. And the number one, of course, indicator for us is he has a, a gentleman's gentleman, right? He has a valet helping him take care of that. So we start to see kind of these American pictures of class on television modeled after British pictures on class um, and, and um, structures of class because we love to tell ourselves the story in the United States that we live in a classless society. But if that's true, how do we show other people when we've made it and we've become successful? So moving on, if I can get my mouse to work, there we go. 
um, Upstairs Downstairs, which aired on PBS in the 1970s, is really kind of the the uber source for Downton Abbey. So it was a, a hugely successful television show in the UK and in America. Um, it was actually created um, by Jean Marsh and Eileen Atkin, um, Eileen Atkin, who's still acting today. Um, the, both of their mothers had worked in domestic service, and so they wanted to create a television show that really focused on an aristocratic household, but from the servant's point of view. And so you had the Lord Bellamy, Lord and Lady Bellamy, the upstairs family, and you had this large kind of cast of servants downstairs, and you saw the relationships between the two of them. And it was very, very popular. Um, they did do kind of a reboot, kind of going into the 1930s a couple of years ago, could be 10 years ago now, um, which wasn't as successful as the original show. But you see a lot of the models, if you went back and watched this, of what you see in Downton Abbey today as well. Some of you might remember Mr. Belvedere, who was kind of it was a sitcom in the 1980s. Um, it's actually based on a 1941 novel, um, which looks at a um, British writer who wants to write kind of a satirical novel about the American nouveau riche. And so he decides to pose as a butler and come over to the United States and spy on America. Um, and, and this American family uh, kind of in order to um, get some fodder for his novel. Uh, so you get kind of also that stereotypical uh, superior British servant who's critiquing of the family he's taking care of as well. Of course, we talked about Downton Abbey. It's the most successful television show that Masterpiece Theater that PBS has ever had in their more than 50 year history with a huge cast. And now, of course, two successful movies as well. Um, one thing that um, people really like about Downton Abbey is that it's quite historically accurate. You know, they integrate a lot of real historical events like um, the Spanish flu, which we see early on. We see, you know, um, High Clare, Downton Abbey becoming a hospital um, for um, people injured from the war and things like that. But a lot of the characters and their relationships are also grounded in history. So um, when they announced their casting originally, there's a lot of critique that Lady Grantham was actually going to be played by an American actress. They thought, oh, ITV, you're pandering to those American audiences again. But it's actually based on lots of similar kinds of relationships um, that were happening in the 19th and 20th century between landed European aristocrats and American heiresses. And the Granthams was, were actually based on the marriage between Charles Spencer Churchill and Consuelo Vanderbilt in about the 1870s. So Charles Spencer Churchill was the Duke of Marlborough, and he has a wonderful estate called Blenheim Palace right outside of Oxford. It is still in the Duke of Marlborough's family today. You can tour it, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, like many aristocrats, he found himself house rich and cash poor in the 19th century. So he went about looking for an heiress who could give him an influx of cash so he could keep the family estate. Now, meanwhile, in the United States, we have a huge rise of industrial barons, right? So you've got railway barons, we've got steel barons, um, you've got the Carnegies, the Rothschilds, the Vanderbilts. They have are making money hand over fist, but in America, again, since we don't have an aristocracy, how do you show you know, America and the rest of the world that you are successful? So a lot of these families look to Europe to marry off their children to titled aristocrats. And this is kind of what happened with Consuela and Charles Spencer Churchill. So her father from the railway industry bequeathed her basically a dowry, which is the equivalent today, are you ready? Of 60 million American dollars in railway stock. So that was a good profitable marriage, right? So Charles Spencer Churchill gets all this money and the Vanderbilts get a duke as a son-in-law and everybody lives happily ever after. Now, many of you, of course, may recognize Charles Spencer Churchill's name, right? Churchill, yes, he is related to, he's a, a great uncle for Winston Churchill um, that we know. Winston Churchill's grave is actually over by Blenheim Palace. He's also a Spencer. Anybody know what a Spencer? Heard of any famous Spencers? Yes. <laughs> Diana. Diana, that's right. Yep, absolutely. So she was like fourth cousin 
to the Duke of Marlborough um, as well. And Consuela Vanderbilt is, I never can remember whether she's a grandmother or great grandmother to the American designer, Gloria Vanderbilt. And then of course, she's a, even a great greater to Anderson Cooper, right? Who's Gloria Vanderbilt's son. Apparently, I haven't read it, but apparently his recent autobiography, he talks about his family history and he talks about Consuela Vanderbilt. She threw, used to throw these apparently legendary parties that she would throw a weekend get together that would cost the equivalent of like $6 million. Right? So we're talking big time money here, right? Just for a weekend party. The other thing, of course, which is super fun about Downton Abbey is that you can go there and if you know you've probably watched a million specials on PBS where you can go to the real High Clare Castle. Um, the castle itself is something like 32,000 square feet. It's not that old in terms of manor houses. Remember we looked, talked about, um, now I'm going to forget it. I gave this talk and I can't remember. Some of them are 500 years old. This one's only about 175 years old. Um, so it's Victorian. Um, it's got about 6,000 acres. Um, it's got an Egyptian museum inside. So um, one of the previous earls of Carnarvon was a explorer and invested in a lot of archaeological digs. And he was one of the people who um, discovered King Tut's tomb. So there are replicas of King Tut's tomb and other items from different kind of Egyptian digs in the household. One of my favorite things too is that you can rent a room. Would you like to have like a a wedding shower or things like that there you know in the last 10 or so years the prices start at 25,000 pounds so that's about $35,000 just for the room but you could have an event there right as well um they have pictures of their servants on the website they still have they say about 70 indoor domestic servants to maintain the household they, they, they tell us this is Colin, their butler. I like that they kind of humanize these servants in the household that they have there. You can see pictures of the current owners, which is the, um, the current um, Earl of, and Countess of Carnarvon. They're beautifully gorgeous people, as you can see. I love this picture because if you look at the bottom of their pant legs, I don't know if you can see my mouse, they've got dirt from the dog. So this is like real people, right? And if you watch any special on um, PBS, you know, they make you believe that you could go to the gift shop and the Earl will be like wearing an apron and cashing you out at the cash register, which I love as well. <laughs> Their website also is, is very tuned into our curiosity about the relationships and the histories between the servants and the aristocrats. And they have an entire webpage just dedicated to um, the history that they know about the upstairs downstairs relationships um, from the um, past of the, of the castle itself. Now, one thing I think that the Downton Abbey kind of juggernaut is also really good at, even before they came out with the first movie, is they've done a very good job of keeping their audiences engaged, um, even when we were between seasons or before the movie came out. So there are a lot of books that you can buy about Downton Abbey for Downton Abbey fans, whether they're companion books or copies of the scripts. Um, they've got the world of Downton Abbey books, which kind of tell you about like the imagined history of the family and the household itself. There's lots of gift books, you know, so you can get all of, you know, Maggie Smith's kind of favorite um, best quips and sayings from the show and cookbooks as well. So you can cook like them. Um, my favorites, though, are the parody books. So you can see there's a woman who knitted, I know for the library, Liz, you got to get these, right? <laughs> there's a children's book where this woman knitted these little mice and then created these mystery stories for children with backdrops of Downton Abbey. And then of course, Downton Tabby, where they just replaced the heads of all the characters with cats, which I just think is a great book for anybody. Um, Julian Fellows um, has not been just cashing the checks from Downton Abbey for the last, you know, 10 to 13 years. He continues to be a pretty prolific writer. And if you look at the titles of the covers of any of his books, you can see, you know, he kind of comes back over and over again to that upstairs, downstairs, life of the aristocrats, servants, um, in lots of his books. Um, Belgravia was actually a limited television series um, a couple of years ago. And now, of course, he's got the Gilded Age, kind of like the Downton Abbey in America television show on HBO, I think, HBO Max now. Um, and there's even magazines out there that you can sew your own clothing to look like it's from the 1920s, right? You can be a flapper like you're in Downton Abbey. Now, we've kind of looked at kind of the traditional kinds of stories. You know, you've got, you know, Butler as absent father. We've got different kinds of stories, you know, British superiority. 
Americans, um, and I did touch upon um, Americans' insecurity about housekeeping and parenting. And so when you get to the 2000s, you know, after kind of decades of these stories, you started to see some new versions of this that kind of started to turn some of these narratives on their head. And one of my favorites was the reality TV show, The Super Nanny. I don't know if any of you saw this. It was on for six years on ABC. And it's a reality show where this, um, this British nanny named Jo Frost, who was nannies to aristocratic families in England, and she would come into these disastrous American families and help them raise their children. So it's the same plot kind of every time you would come in, you would have 15 minutes of footage of these horrible, horrible children. <laughs> um, jo you kind of would observe the parents with them. She'd send the parents away for a weekend. And then in like five minutes, she would have the best behaved children ever. You know, they were doing all their chores. They were saying, thank you. They were amazing. And then at the end of the show, she'd bring the parents back in and basically say every time, this is all your fault, <laughs> right? Like you're not disciplining your kids. You know, they need structure. And this was, and I don't even like reality TV. This show was just addicting over and over again, showing, you know, Americans kind of going to themselves about we're, we're terrible parents. We don't know how to teach manners and we don't know how to discipline our children. And we needed to bring in this British aristocratic kind of nanny or nanny to the aristocrats in order to show us how to be good parents. And so um, it kind of not only kind of shares, kind of changes that kind of parenting, the authority model, but also puts a nanny um, in kind of the front seat in a way that we have don't see that often. Um, most of the times, the stories we see over and over again are about men as butlers. So Liz has been waiting for this one too, right? Another, we talked also that the majority, the significant majority of these stories are about British characters, even when we import them into American families. The Nanny, which was a sitcom on CBS um, in the mid to late 90s, kind of flips that whole national storyline on its head. So instead of bringing a British servant into an American family and telling us how we're doing it all wrong, this show actually had a British family in the United States who needed a nanny and they hire an American um, to serve that role. And it's the wonderful comedian Fran Drescher in the silver lame mini skirt suit, in case you didn't know who was the American in this picture. It's not the people in Kashmir, right? So um, it's this great kind of flip here um, of that kind of nationalist um, storyline where we had the you know British characters t teaching the Americans how to parent and w understanding what class is and what etiquette is and you have this kind of really crass American come into this British family to teach them about kind of letting go and American ingenuity and creativity and humor um, in ways that's really different from the traditional storyline that we had. Now one of the most kind of interesting examples and I think in many ways, the most subversive is um, is Will Smith's The Fresh Prince of Bel Air, which was on um, NBC in 1990 to 1996. Now, you may have noticed, or it may have gone right by you, that most of the examples I've given so far have predominantly or significantly all white characters. All the servants are white. All the families are white. There are a few examples in American television where we can go back where we have black servants. Um, and I do make a distinction between slave narratives and servant narratives, which I'm happy to kind of talk about later if anybody has a question. So for example, if you remember the comedy um, Soap, which was on the late 70s, early 80s, uh, it has an American um, white dysfunctional family. They had a black butler actually played by Robert Guillaume. And that character Benson ends up getting his own television show, if you remember, and then Benson was on for several years and he works as the housekeeper, or the manager of a household for this white governor. Um, the Jeffersons actually had a, a, a black um, daily um, housekeeper who came in. So there are examples of that. But the Fresh Prince is kind of quite unusual in that, you know, in the 90s, it was it was trying to show um, the American public, an example of a black upper, you know, upwardly middle class or even upper class family in America. And what would that look like? And around the same time, remember, you've got the Cosby show, right? So you've got Bill Cosby's character where he works as a gynecologist. Felicia Rashad was a successful lawyer, incredibly successful, you know, black upwardly middle class family with no domestic service in that show anywhere that we saw. 
But in this show, you know, they they take kind of that um, class mobility and class success, see it through an African American family's eyes, um, and they model it exactly on what we see on these other American kind of success stories. So if you don't know the story of of the Fresh Prince, you know, you have Will Smith, who's you know, a young teenager in Philadelphia, he's getting in with the wrong crowd. So his mother decides she's going to send him to go live with his aunt and uncle in Bel Air. And they are incredibly wealthy. And so there's this kind of class clash that happens between the kids of the family who go to private school, um, who are incredibly, incredibly privileged, and Will Smith, who's coming from kind of a war, working class dynamic. And then what that means also for that family to be wealthy and black. So one of the ways they show you this, right, is they have a butler. They have a black butler. Um, his character's name is Joffrey Butler, right? In case we didn't know what he did um, for a living. And he's incredibly successful. He, we know from the show, he's a graduate of Oxford University. He was a Olympiad. Um, he was a runner in the Olympics. He worked as a butler for Led Zeppelin. He was a sparring partner for Chuck Norris. He's incredibly accomplished. Um, and you have this kind of amazingly rich um, history for him. And yet, you know, also kind of modeled within the story of success, though, is that this is the success that a character like Joffrey can accomplish as, as working as a butler. So even kind of interestingly, this, this, this Black successful family story, they go back, and he's British, to have a British butler, just like we've seen back in Family Affair or in all of these other kind of white stories about American success as well. Now, you know, we must think, well, butlers are dead and gone, right? So nobody knows how to do this anymore and there's nothing like this. There's, to the contrary, actually, there is an uptick in domestic service and people working in domestic service over the last 30 years. Um, so you can, you know, go online and research how to become a professional butler even today. So you can go, there's an international guild of butlers. You can go to butler school in the United Kingdom and learn how to take care of households. Um, you can go on to websites and there's different placement agencies. Some of them like Gray Coats has been in business for over a hundred years. And their sole role is to advertise for families who are looking for and people who want to be employed in domestic service. And so you can go on and read these job descriptions about, you know, like joining a new butler team on a beautiful estate in Surrey and, you know, a fa high profile families looking for a butler to join their household team. I'm always struck by these two because these are people who are getting people to join a team. Like they already have a team of servants and they want more people to come in. You can see how much money you could make and the different kinds of perks that you get. You can even look at the same kind, what kind of work do butlers do today, you know, in the 21st century compared to maybe what the 19th century was. Some of it is very similar to what we had in the day, you know, they're cleaning silver and taking care of antiques and art and taking care of a household and they may be a valet, but they also have more modern duties. They could be managing a property portfolio. Um, they could do, you know, event planning, they could be a personal ass assistant and do um, maintain their diaries and different aspects like that. When you start looking to hire butlers, you can also find some more kind of exotic butlers. So one of my favorite finds was this company, um, Naked Butlers of London, that you can actually hire for parties. So um, if you would like to have, you know, a bachelorette party or different kinds of thing, you can actually hire a bunch of um, naked butlers in the buff who will come and work as your bartenders and different elements like that. So you don't know what you're going to find when you start Googling, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, what we start to kind of see in a lot of these different examples is this real fascination, not just kind of with, with British um, servant narratives and characters, but I think really more with British class structures and societies. The United States, when we start looking at our own history, we're a pretty new country. We're only just over a couple of hundreds of years old. And so it's, we, I think that many of these stories show us that we have a little bit of insecurity about our own history as well as our own success, particularly when it comes to class identity and wealth. So what you find over and over again, and since America continues with the 
myth that we are a classless society and everyone is equal. When we have groups or families who are significantly wealthy and successful, it's a challenge for American narratives to show what that success looks like and how those people and families might be different. And so what you see when you start looking at these histories in media, particularly in television and in film, is that American storytellers go back over and over again to British aristocratic structures um, and society to try to mirror that to show American success stories. At the same time, though, I think we want to pause and think about what does that tell us about our own definitions of class about our own insecurities about success and even perhaps kind of our national identity and what it also might tell us about some challenges about our um, problematic history with race domestic service and wealth in this country as well so i'm going to stop there and i'll stop sharing and i'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has anything there's a ton in the chat i see I'm going to stop sharing. Back and forth, someone's giving book recommendations. Oh, that's good. I got some books too, but we could definitely do more. That's the and great you will thing always. Great there's thing a about a library people. program. There's always book recommendations. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> May I ask a question from the Netherlands? Yes. It's two, it's two o'clock in the morning at, at the moment. <laughs> wow. But I'm doing my best. <laughs> in, the begin, in the beginning of your talk, you said. Um, uh, about the numbers of people mm -hmm. working in uh, country estates. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1901, there was, I saw an, an enormous growth of female servants mm -hmm. from uh, almost 950,000 to one and a half million. Mm -hmm. What was the reason for that growth? Yeah, um, I think there's a couple of things that happen there. Um, one, we see in the 19th century, even there, they, you know, they call it, there's a, I mean, there's the new woman problem, which is kind of the educated woman problem, right? But there's also the redundant woman problem in the 19th century in England. So we have a lot of women, we have too many men and women for men. So there's no, there's not enough opportunities for marriage. And this is where we see a lot of emigration for women leaving to go to Australia, to the United States, to um, the Commonwealth of the colonies at that time period to marry men they've never even met before because they have um, no dowry or no prospects um, to marry any men in England. And so there's not a lot of ways for many women to be able to support themselves. And so I think there's a, a real increase there that comes um, with that for the women. There's also that subsequent drop of the men, right? So we see that kind of population shift that's happening there as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Oh, um, I see Mark, or I believe Rosemary is raising their hands. Mm -hmm. You just have to unmute your mic. There we go. Um, I just have read a whole bunch of books by servants and basically slaves for what they get paid and how they're treated. And they're all start back in the 1920s that I, or actually before that. And it just happened to progress as time went on and it fascinated me how each group of servants treated each other and how the ones who were on the upper level wouldn't even talk to the ones on the lower and just they were treated so poorly it fascinated me to read and isn't those that interesting um that what a difference that is to the way that we portray them in the stories right so let alone like how they get along with each other, but how they get along with the with the family in the household, you know, our, you know, stories love to say like, oh, they're like members of the family, they're, they're sharing their heartaches and their medical stuff. Yeah, not at all. Yeah, that's a, it's a great point of like, that hierarchy of class within the servants themselves. That's a great point. There was, let me just add on to that real quick. There was one of the stories that I was reading where there was, um, a, a servant, who, a young woman who was probably lived, worked there forever. She was down in the kitchen. And for some reason, she was asked to go see either the master or the whoever, somebody higher level. And she had never been in the room before. It was one of the big elaborate 
And she was just fascinated. She had been there a couple of years and had never been in that room or even upstairs like that. That, that have fascinated me. There's, you know, every time I give this talk, I take slides out too, because it's still too long. Um, but there's one that I have where, you know, it's about in the 1940s, there was this massive estate um, called Knoll um, in England and Kent. And afterwards, when they couldn't find any servants, right, all the girls were going into the cities and all the men had died in the war. And there was this estate that had something like 250 rooms and they had one maid. Oh. And she had to clean that whole place. So I thought, who would take that job, wow. right? You know, to think like you'd pretty much do a room a day and you'd have to go and, and do it all over again. I saw yeah. some um, chat about Stanley Ager's books, right? The Butler's Guide to Running the Home in the chat. Um, I think, Anna, that was you. Um, he is a great resource. He's a, a, you know, had been a butler for a long time and has all kinds of how-to books and help books. He was also hired by Downton Abbey. Um, I believe to be um, an advisor, right? And so they would have him be there, like they'd be setting up tea in the drawing room and he'd say, you'd never put the table there, <laughs> right? Like, and move, have to move things around. So they hired real people to be advisors as well on the show to make sure that they were doing things authentically and correctly, which is amazing to me. Now I still watch, you know, they'll have specials on PBS talking about Buckingham Palace and setting up the table for an estate dinner and measuring you know how far away the spoons go and which china they're going to use and you think who knows how to do that anymore right but there one are of the, one of the former butlers of the royal family has his mm -hmm. own youtube channel and he gives <laughs> you advice how to eat things and how to sit and mm -hmm. how to address a lady it's very yeah. interesting and amusing yeah. yeah, and useful, right? That's a yeah. great point, and useful. Exactly. It's called the Royal Butler. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah. I had a question also, if I yes. may, if I may. Um, is there a difference between uh, the noble families in treating their uh, servants? I can imagine that one family, uh, for instance, the Carnivans of uh, Highclere, Treat, treated their servants in a different way than, for instance, uh, the churches? Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, I think that, and I think it'd be hard to, to generalize. The best we could do would be to find a biography, right, or an autobiography by people, who, but it would only be specific, I think, to a specific earl or the specific yeah. duke, you know, during their time period. So I think it's harder Sometimes I always think it has more to do with what kind of person you are than your, mm -hmm. you know, whether you see, I believe there were, you know, aristocrats and people who had domestic servants who saw their servants as people, as humans. Yeah. And I think mm -hmm. there are also people who did not see them as humans, yeah. you know, yeah. that saw them as machines or furniture, right? They're just to kind of make sure that they were unseen, right? All the hidden doors yeah. and everything, right? You were never supposed to be seen mm -hmm. like magical elves. Also, were many servants able um, able to read or write? Because that could also be why we don't have primary sources. Yeah, one, of the, one of, of the earliest, there was a great um, diary by a footman named William Taylor. It's like William Taylor, Diary of William Taylor Footman from the 1830s, where um, he worked in a household that the, it was a widow and she was really passionate about literacy. And so she taught all of her servants how to read and write so the end of the day he would go back to his room and he would practice his writing by writing about what he did all day which became one of the earliest like by autobiographies of what a, an average day of a servant's life was really like and that was because you know, it's a good point it wasn't really until the 1880s that england had a a national education act that provided um state-funded education for all children from five to 11. So I would assume many, many of them would have been, could have been illiterate um, or might've learned in a farm school or something like that. Maybe to sign their name. There they wouldn't have time to read. <laughs> there is a question in the chat. It says, when I went to the mansions in Connecticut, it looked like some of the mansions had pictures of their servants on the walls with nicknames. It seems they were, oh, come on. They were very close to some of them. Is that true in England also? It's true sometimes. Um, at one talk I gave in Bristol it was amazing. This um, this woman came and she brought this huge black and white photo 
Um, and she was an immigrant from the United Kingdom and she had relatives who had basically were in domestic service. And it was a picture of the family with all the servants behind it, maybe from 1912 or the 1890s. So it was a family kind of household photo that had the servants in it as, along with all those people. Um, so I think there are absolutely some of them. It particularly when it comes to governesses and nannies, because those women were the mothers to those children. And many times they had a very, very close relationship um, and, and those really were the people who cared for them. You know, many of these people who were born to, you know, the highest echelon society never saw or spent any time with their parents at all. And so the governesses and the nannies were their mothers. And so they had really, um, you know, kind of heartfelt, strong relationships with a lot of those um, women and, and made sure that they were pensioned off and taken care of in their, you know, when they became older as well. Um, that's what I love. And I grew up in the Midwest. So I, you know, I've given this talk in New England and so many people often tell me, oh, my grandmother's house, you know, in Massachusetts had servants quarters. I mean, I'll just say in the Midwest, like you don't see that, but because some of the households, you know, in the towns on the, on the East coast are so much older, we have a lot of people who talk about, you know, my grandmother, you know, that's how she came over to the United States was, she was hired to be, you know, a housemaid. And that's, you know, she did that in houses in Boston or in Massachusetts or in Connecticut or things like that. So architecturally even, New England is more set up for turn of the century um, service as well that other parts of the United States aren't. This is really fascinating as well. I think we have time for one more question. Um, who wants to be the final question asker? Oh, okay. I have a question. Um, you talked about um, Buckingham Palace now with um, servants. Any idea how many they have? Gosh, that's a great question. I want to Google this right now because I don't, but that's a great question, Rosemary. Let me Google it. <laughs> Google has every answer, right? <laughs> Hold on. I imagine we're going to faint when we hear the number. <laughs> 400. Oof. Wow. Yeah, just at Buckingham. It says domestic servants, chefs, footmen, cleaners, plumbers, gardeners, chauffeurs, electricians, two people whose job is to look after the 300 clocks. <laughs> it has 775 rooms, including 19 state rooms, 52 royal and guest rooms, 188 staff bedrooms, 92 offices, and 78 bathrooms. I wonder how many they have at Windsor Castle. Because <laughs> remember, that's going to have their own servants. <laughs> Woo! 1,200. Woo! Wow. At Windsor. She employs 1,200 people at Windsor Castle. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so now Buckingham Palace looks like a condo, <laughs> right? <laughs> wow. That's amazing. And then she has Balmoral. Right? I mean, she has many estates, many castles and estates. And all and the servants stay there. Yeah. And there's no crossover between the two. They're all in individual, they're all stationed at the individual places. I would say mostly, uh, unless it's like their, their equerry who does their calendar, you know, which is their personal assistant. Probably very few. Their ladies made, ladies in waiting, people who dress them probably go with them. You know, valets would go with them, but cooks, housemaids, all those kinds of things. Some... Mm -hmm. Some households would sh shut up a house, right? So like when it was too hot to be in London for the season, they would close up the house and take almost all the servants with them into a country estate, but the royal family doesn't do that. <laughs> well, I to say- um, um, Can I ask one more real quick one? Uh, yep, sure. <laughs> um, are people who are servants now, are they thought of in a derogatory way or positive? That's one thing I didn't talk of. There was actually a real cultural shift in the early 20th century too, where in the 19th century, going into domestic service was seen as a real um, patriotic thing to do because that, and you're serving the greatest families, you were serving the nation and the aristocrats also had a duty to take care of the people who are dependent upon their estate. That really turns with the rise of industrialism right, right in the 1920s. And so working class people looked at other 
servants as like, why would you want to be a slave? Why do you want to, you know, do that and have them? Um, so they were kind of name called and really disrespected. Um, so a lot of people have turned away because of that as well. I think that, you know, nowadays people just don't know people who are in those positions. Um, so I don't think you have as much as a kind of any cultural criticism as much um, as we did, I would say in like 1920 compared to 2020. Think about how many people have like au pairs, like in the United States even now, right? I mean, that's the big, and a lot of us in the United States now have some kind of domestic service. You know, I would say like, how many of us get it, take our dry cleaning in, right? How many people have a lawn service? How many people um, have somebody cleaning their houses or plowing their snow? All of those are pieces of domestic service, you know? And that's on the I was, rise. I was a nanny in grad school because it was uh, the best way to work with my school schedule. <laughs> and you probably got free living conditions. I didn't live there, but it was all under the table money. So uh, don't tell Uncle Sam. I will not tell Uncle Sam. <laughs> One of my students who graduated because she wanted to live in New York City and travel, you know, she graduated with her bachelor's degree in English and her first job after college was being a nanny in New York City. She got to go to Paris. You know, she lived in this wow. you know, amazing apartment in New York. Uh, interesting <laughs> all right well it's so much to talk about <laughs> almost eight o'clock so um uh professor mcclellan thank you for this wonderful talk um was super interesting and seeing in the chat a lot of people were really happy with it so um as, oh yeah it is two o'clock here so um <laughs> we'll let you go to sleep but thank you for joining us that's amazing yes, that's amazing that's so <laughs> power of zoom that's right <laughs> Thank All right, you, well, everyone. It was really excellent. I enjoyed it. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much. Thanks. That was really right. good. Now you can thank go you. watch all the movies, the TV shows, and read all the books. I have a list of books that I read. If you want me, I can drop them off at the library. Oh, there you sure. go. Okay. Awesome. Well, everyone, thank you for coming and have a wonderful night. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Good night. Good night.